Hey, this is episode number 50 of Gen X Amplified, and today we are going to talk all things midlife, mid-career, Gen X, and what it takes to be a modern elder. That is because my featured guest is the one and only Chip Conley, strategic advisor for Airbnb and the best-selling author of the phenomenal book titled Wisdom at Work, The Making of a Modern Elder. Great stuff. So, are you ready? Let's do it. I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to write a book that helps people in midlife navigate their midlife transitions and reimagine how to repurpose themselves so that they're relevant in their 40s, 50s, 60s, or even beyond. Welcome welcome to Gen X Amplified, where we bring you inspirational and entertaining conversations with successful Gen X leaders and entrepreneurs. This is the show created just for you. The powerful generation between the boomers and millennials to help you you amplify your story, maximize your impact, and become Gen Exceptional in business and in life. Now, now, here's your host, Adrian Porter. Hey, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Gen X Amplified. This is the podcast and the platform dedicated to inspiring Gen Xers and those at mid-career and mid-life to find our voice, unlock our inner power so we can maximize our impact on the world and succeed at work and in life. This is Adrian Porter. As always, thank you so much for listening to the podcast. I truly, truly appreciate it. And today, I am so excited and cannot wait to dive into this conversation. I've been waiting for this for a while because my guest is an esteemed best-selling author, entrepreneur, and I consider an overall change agent. He currently serves as a strategic advisor for Airbnb, which is the world's largest hospitality brand in the world. And as an entrepreneur, he founded a while back and launched, now I'm going to butcher this, but I'm going to do it anyway. (laughs) He launched Joie de Vivre, Turning, that's good, that's good. Adrian, I'm impressed. <laughs> turning it into the la- second largest boutique hotel brand in America. He has also written numerous best-selling books, including Peak and Emotional Equations. But, but his latest book, his latest masterpiece titled Wisdom at Work, The Making of a Modern Elder, was inspired by his post 50 year old experiences as both a mentor and an unexpected intern at Airbnb. And he is here on Gen X Amplified to discuss not only his journey, but for us to deep dive into this great book. So everyone, please welcome my brilliant, booming, and honorary Gen Exceptional guest, Chip Conley. Chip, how's it going, man? Great, Adrian. Thank you. It's great to be with you. Likewise. Thank you so much. It's funny, I I mentioned uh, honorary Gen Exceptional, and and actually it's my vision to re- frame and redefine Gen X as Gen Exceptional, but I said honorary because you are a boomer and typically we have a lot of Gen Xers on this show so people can hear the great stories of other Gen Xers, that generation that's sometimes often overlooked, but very powerful. But it's funny, you're right, you're a boomer, but if you go by Bill Strauss and and, um, Neil Howe's definition of generation, you're almost on the cusp of 61, but you're definitely a boomer. But today you're an honorary Gen Exceptional. Thank you. I, um, you know what? This is great. I Gen X unfortunately doesn't get enough attention. Yes. Uh, and, and it do, don't take it personally. I think it's just a numbers game. But yes, you know, I, I I appreciate you doing this. Yeah, it is. It's it's definitely a numbers. I say that all the time, and we are definitely squeezed between two behemoth great generations of boomers and millennials. But what was the catalyst for this mission and movement for me being of Gen X is that yeah, we. All of us, you know, we all have very powerful virtues, but it's my mission to help amplify the virtues of Gen Xers. But we'll talk more about that because your book was really inspirational for me and a breath of fresh air considering my focus and my Mm -hmm. mission and what I see what you're doing uh, with the book, with the movement, with the academy, which we're going to talk about. Oh, my God. It was like we're kindred spirits (laughs) in, in a different generation, but we both have the same passionate mission. So, Chip, before we deep dive into this awesome book, I would love for you just to walk our listeners briefly along your journey. You don't have to do your full memoir, (laughs) but but just kind of really talk about your journey as an entrepreneur, as an author, and really those transformative moments in your life that led you 
to pen this great book? So, I, you know, it's funny. Um, I, <laughs> to be a modern elder today, I, you know, I was sort of the so-called boy wonder uh, many years ago because I started a hotel company mm-hmm. at age 26, which is not the kind, no, not the age most people would start a boutique hotel company. Um, it was it was called Joie de Vivre. I, I appreciate the fact that the uh, the mission statement of the company, which was to create joy, um, mm-hmm. was also our uh, a name, Joie de Vivre, mm-hmm. Joy of Life in French. Right. Um, and so I was a young a young guy, a young person, uh, without a lot of experience. But ultimately, I ran that company for twenty four years and was and we grew it to thirty five hundred employees and fifty two hotels. And then in the Great Recession, I just said, you know, I'm to hell with it. I'm done. I, I need to move on. And um, I did. I sold the company, and I wasn't sure what was next. Uh, there's a great quote from Robert De Niro in the movie The Intern. Uh, mm-hmm. He says, musicians don't retire. They quit when there's no more music left inside of them. <laughs> and I knew I had some music inside of me, Adrian, but I just wasn't sure who I was going to share it with. And right. that's about the time at age 52 when I heard from the three founders of Airbnb and quite specifically uh, Brian Chesky, who was uh, the CEO and Mm co-founder. And um, he asked me to be his in-house mentor. He wanted me to help him democratize hospitality by taking this little tech company called Airbnb, which I really didn't know much about, Mm -hmm. and um, turning it into one of the world's global hospitality brands. That sounded crazy. Six years ago, Mm -hmm. I, at that time, didn't have an Uber or Lyft app on my phone. I never (laughs) heard of the sharing economy. And all of a sudden, I'd gone from the sort of pioneer boy wonder who could sort of see the future and was making it happen to feeling like I'm this old guy Mm -hmm. (laughs) who's supposed to just share his wisdom with a bunch of people half my age. And that was true. Airbnb was, average age was 26 and I was 52. Wow. So long story short is I joined as the head of global hospitality and strategy my boss was 21 years younger than me, Brian, but I was also his mentor. And I learned what it meant to be both a mentor and an intern at the same time. Wow, that was great. And I'm wondering, when you were asked to join the organization and really help Shepard take, take it to the next level based on your experience and the power of what you did with your organization, and considering, like you said, your age at the time, and you're going to be working around a lot of these quote unquote millennials and have a boss That was, I don't know, what'd you say, 20 years younger, 30 years younger than you? Um, 21 years. 21 years younger than you. I know that it was a moment in your life where you really had to make a big decision. Did you second guess it? Did it take weeks? Did you, and and I read the book, so but for my listeners who may not have, can you just talk a little bit about that? that moment in time where you had to make that decision that you're going to be going from being the captain of your own ship to mm-hmm. now joining aboard a ship of other captains and, and not necessarily stirring the ship, but just a different type of dynamic. Yes. Well, so uh, during my six years at Airbnb, four years in a full-time role, and now two years as a strategic advisor to the founders, uh, I realized that I, there was no roadmap for someone like me. Um, right. You know, a lot of people in midlife, uh, wh- whether they're, let's say, young boomers like me or older Gen Xers or even anybody in Gen X at this point probably, right. can sometimes feel like the world is so different than what you expected it to be because technology and the digital intelligence is so important. Um, and yet, you know, I, I, didn't w- I didn't grow up as a digital native. Um, but the thing that I've been able to cultivate over the years is, is the kind of skills you build over time. And they're usually human skills. They're emotional intelligence and leadership and strategic thinking and um, how to create a team collaboration. Um, And so I guess part of my role in the company was to share my EQ and learn DQ, digital intelligence, from these younger people. Mm -hmm. So it was a bit of a mutual mentorship relationship. Uh, As I, as I started, people started calling me the modern elder in the company. I thought, well, gosh, wouldn't it be interesting to write a book that helps people in midlife uh, navigate their midlife transitions and reimagining, reimagine how to repurpose themselves um, so that they're relevant uh, in their 40s, 50s, 60s, or even beyond. But the, the core audience for my book is really people probably uh, 40 to 65, I'd say. Um, and so that's, uh, that's why I decided to write the book. Um, and I'm proud that it's been a bestseller and it's, it's, and, you know, it's done quite well. 
Well, it's, I, I can definitely tell how it's done really well just based on me reading the book. And there were so many nuggets and you actually hit on a couple of things, which based on the show that we're doing here, considering that midlife is right around the sweet spot of Gen Xers, which is my audience and my mission. And your book, there was it was really a roadmap and an action plan for really how to take Gen Xers and even just midlifers in general, because like you said, the gap is really generationally, sometimes it can span um, late millennials to early boomers. And it's funny because we're living longer now than we did before. So the midlife average age has definitely um, shifted, <laughs> mm-hmm, if you yeah. will, and increase. And, and Airbnb, considering that tech um, organization, and, and actually before I go forward, I must say, because I'm a, a trained marketer at heart, that's what I, that's what I do. Mm-hmm. Um, I am an admirer of great campaigns and I must quickly commend Airbnb because during a time when we were recently for an organization I work for, we're looking to do a brand refresh, I'm always looking for inspiration and I found so much power in the Belong Anywhere campaign. Mm, and so, you. and I'm a fan of Jonathan Mendenhall because oh, I, yes. because I, yes. I live in Atlanta, so I was a fan of his work with Coca-Cola and Wendy Clark uh-huh. and those guys. So I must commend Jonathan, if you're listening, great work. I know you're, <laughs> I know you're kicking butt with your new consultancy right now. Yeah, uh, exactly. But, but I just want to just quickly just say that the whole Belong Anywhere to me helped cement a place in the ethos of, of minds when it comes to sharing economy and Airbnb. So that was really great. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, you know, it's been quite quite a quite a process to take a company that <clears throat> had as three founders who were 24 and 26 years old when they started it right. and have it grow into 191 countries vir- virtually overnight and be a global brand but also be a local brand and how do you <clears throat> how do you market that across cultures? It's a, right. it's a it's been a fascinating experience. Right, it is. So this so you wrote the book and I think I heard you say that the the term or the phrase if you will, the modern elder, you were people were calling you that at Airbnb. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that became just really thrust upon you. It wasn't something that you sat down and said I'm going to be now the modern elder. Uh, no, I listen this uh, that would have been that, um, no, I was <laughs> Joe, Joe, Joe Gebbia, who's co-founder quietly started saying on the side, Chip, do you know like you're our sort of our modern elder in, in the leadership <laughs> team? And when 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 you speak, people sort of uh, get quiet and they really listen to you because there's a sense that there's some wisdom coming out. And I was like, okay, well that's I'm glad to hear that. Mm-hmm. But sometimes I ask really stupid questions about technology <laughs> because I'm the dumbest person in the room when it comes to a lot of the technology strategies and just even you know, I, what, what the heck is Slack? I don't even know how to use that <laughs> damn thing. And, you know, I, I had never used a Google Doc when I joined the company. So, I, you know, I, I've had to learn a lot. So I guess what was interesting to me is to realize that um, I think a modern elder is both curious and wise. Mm-hmm. And cur- what, what curiosity does in life is it opens up possibilities. Okay. And so curiosity sort of says, wow, have we thought about this? Or what if, what if that? Or why don't we think about this? So it's curiosity. But curiosity alone, if you just have curiosity – it's sort of, uh, is not very efficient. It gives you a lot of possibilities. And then wisdom distills down all of the possibilities to what is truly important or essential. Mm. So the combination of curiosity, which is sort of the beginner's mind, uh, and the, and the student Mm -hmm. that combined with the wisdom of the elder, who's a great editor, Mm -hmm. that together makes for a, a beautiful alchemy or combination. No, it definitely it definitely does. And, you know, Chip, in the begin in the early parts of the book, you really hit home and start to to outline rethinking or redefining what we what you call and what we all call probably the three stage life. Mm-hmm. Can you just talk a little bit about that for our audience? What is the typical traditional stages of life and then how you are looking to to introduce and encourage people to re to redefine that? Right. Um, so the. The, the three-stage life is actually a relatively new phenomena in the history of man, mankind, or humankind, mm-hmm. um, and that is that you you learn <clears throat> you learn till you're 20 or 25, you That's earn good. till you're 65, mm-hmm. and then you retire. So you know retirement's a very modern phenomena. So learn, earn, retire. Now that model made sense when everything was sort of very linear in life. You go and graduate from college and go work. You know, for Procter and Gamble in their in their training program, and you know, and you you go up, move up the car, the corporate ladder. Right. But the way we live today is so different than that. Um, it, the idea that we 
you know, leave our learning behind at age 25 doesn't make sense. We're lifelong learning. <laughs> we might take a sabbatical at age 40 to just take a year off to sort of figure out what's next. Mm-hmm. We might retire, if we're lucky, we might retire early and then come back into the workplace later. Mm-hmm. Um, we might even go back and get a graduate degree in our 50s. So mm-hmm. um, the, the premise that uh, there's this linear path doesn't make sense. And therefore, it means that we, <clears throat> as we age, need to be open to constantly uh, learning something new. Mm. Um, this is part of the reason why I created this thing called the Modern Elder Academy, right, right. Which, which is the world's first midlife wisdom school. It's uh, three acres on a beachfront in Mexico, in nice. Baja, California. <laughs> nice. And the reason for that was to say, gosh, where do we go to imagine our future um, and to mine our mastery, really get clear on how, what we've learned cultivate that wisdom and then harvest it potentially in a wholly new repurposed way. Mm. I love that. Where do we go to imagine our future? That's, that was very irrelevant uh, throughout the book. And yeah, the three stage life, it is traditional, but you're right because of technology, because we're living longer because of this knowledge economy, the learning stage and learning process, not only does it not, uh, cease when you reach a certain age is is actually always on even during the age you're on with with the with the internet and having accessibility to all these different tools and then you mentioned <clears throat> the retirement or even if you wanted to go back to go to school if you wanted to if you if you graduated college you may not necessarily want to start a job uh, immediately um, so I love the fact that you talked about just redefining these different stages. So what that does, it puts people in the mid-career, mid-life generation and phase to think that the doors aren't closing as fast as you think. That Correct. there's continual learning up until you're in your late uh, 50s, 60s, 70s. There was one um, case study I, which I, I, I loved because I, I saw her TED Talk a, a while back and you spoke about her, Elizabeth White. And mm, I love was, her. I love her. <laughs> yeah, I I saw her talk. Oh, I guess some time ago, just based on just my affinity for just again generational uh, empowerment, and I thought it was a wonderful talk. And then when I saw, Ray got your book and saw her case study, I said, "Oh my God, this is so fascinating." She has a really powerful story, and she's been able to, I guess, redefine her life and to help others when they're fifties um, or sixties become more empowered and really find their unique self. Yes, uh, she's um, she has a book that just came out, and she's uh, she's fierce. She's just fierce in terms of her resilience. She's she's she proposes creating resilient circles as you get older, uh, uh, with the intent of helping people provide what I call emotional insurance. Emotional you know, there's, insurance. There's a yeah, we have property and liability insurance. So mm-hmm. you know, if we have a rainy day, so to speak. But who, where's our emotional insurance? <laughs> I mean, ge- generally, it's our family and our friends. Right. Uh, but for men in particular, um, we aren't very good at, at this. We aren't really good about creating the structure of like a board of directors of, um, for your emotional state, mm. um, for, especially when you're going through a difficult time. So um, Elizabeth's book, uh, you know, she's a very accomplished uh, Harvard Business School grad, worked for the World Bank, and then in her mid-50s, uh, she found herself completely un- unemployable, uh, and it's not because she was bad at what she did. It was because people looked at her as an older woman who was past her prime. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and she and they were wrong, <laughs> but I, I highly recommend her book. Oh yeah, yeah. She she is she is fascinating. It's I think, and I'm trying to remember. I think the book is something about uh, fifty and loving. It. Oh, I want to make sure it's fifty five unemployed and faking normal. That's right, correct. right, exactly. right, right. Yeah, fifty-five unemployed and faking normal. Yeah, she's she's wonderful. So it, it's so interesting. You just mentioned um, having like this board of advisors or people that are around you to help support you emotionally when you're going through different times. And and I think about my own personal journey in this show and and also the mission that what you're doing with this book and your academy. When people when we are approaching midlife, mid career, and again that primarily as Gen Xers, but it can range from late 30s to 70s or, 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 mm-hmm. or, or mid, midlifers. It's so ironic that I believe uh, the gentleman who coined the term midlife crisis, Elliot uh, Jocks, I believe, Jack, yeah, uh, right. he, he, was, he actually coined the term in 1965, which is actually the birth year that Pew Research recognizes as a start for Gen Xers, which is very interesting to me. Interesting. <laughs> well, I think the thing that's curious, uh, you know, Adrian, is here we, he, you know, he was a psychologist who coined that term. Frankly, a lot of people didn't respect the term. Uh, mm. 
and and there's been a lot of people over time who've really struggled with the idea of midlife crisis. Right. Um, but the truth is, it's 54 years later <laughs> since, <laughs> since that term was coined, and I can't say that we as a society have done a lot to help uh, address the crisis. And in fact, I think the the midlife period is now not 20 years long. It used to be considered 20 years long from 40 to 60 or 45 to 65. Right. Today, I would suggest mid- midlife is a marathon and it lasts from 35 to 75. And the reason I think it lasts that long is because in, an, in a digital society where power is moving briskly to the young, mm-hmm. more and more people in their mid-30s start to feel a little irrelevant, especially in technology-enabled industries. Um, and then people are going to work often by choice or necessity mm. to their mid-70s. That's true. And so I think when you're in the workplace, you're still in midlife in some ways. It's, right. you know, mid- older age happens after that. And, and if you're going to live to age 100, which a lot of us will do, you know, the idea that, that midlife goes to 75 is not, you know, not unheard of. So if midlife is 40 years long and it, and it used to be a crisis when it was 20 years long, mm-hmm. damn, <laughs> we, have a, we have a double crisis now, 40 years long. <laughs> we do. We, we do. Well, it's, it's interesting. You did mention that um, there's not a lot of, I guess, <clears throat> outlets or platforms to address the the change or the the widening of the midlife, which I would I would argue that what you're doing is helping to do that. Um, is based on what you're doing and the principles and and the strategies and the you know helping people embrace their modern elderness, for lack of a better word, um, and just rethink what they're trying to do. I'm trying to do that with my platform, with Genex Amplified, and even my consulting or coaching helping people in generation you i want to read i want to read a before i get into a little bit more about specific principles from your book that could be applicable not could be will be applicable to gen xers and mid, and mid-career because that's at the core of your audience I, I i really found there was a quote among hundreds of lines that i loved in the book but there was one in particular that's applicable to what we're talking about and i love it it's on page 67 in the lesson one evolve and you read and you wrote and i quote as we enter midlife, we embark upon a creative evolution that amplifies our specialness while editing out the extraneous. After a lifetime of accumulation, we can concentrate on what we do best, what gives us meaning, what we want to leave behind. We become unmasked. And I remember when I read that chip, I put like 10 stars around it. I highlighted uh-huh. it because it was it really was the essence of literally my, what I'm trying to do and my purpose and what drives me to help empower my generation because mm-hmm. you know the the name of the show is Gen X Amplified and it's about not tearing down other generations because I always I always find myself and I want to underscore that consistently because a lot of times when we get into these generational conversations with other people or the media there tends to be a bashing of the other generations mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I have never, and I, and I, and it, it bothers me, but what I do, I, because they're, we're all, like I say, we're brilliant boomers, magnificent millennials. My role is to amplify the virtues of Gen Xers because to your point earlier, we don't get a lot of ink. We're squeezed between two big g- generations yet. We are now in this critical stage of our lives in our forties, early fifties, uh, approaching leadership positions right now, according to research, a recent study, over 51% of all global leadership positions are being held by Gen Xers now. We're taking care of our kids. We're influencing these young, passionate Gen Zs. So, because those are our kids. And so mm-hmm. my role in life and my mission and what keeps me up as, at night is to say, hey, we don't get a lot of ink. Um, we're sometimes overlooked because of sheer numbers. And we haven't been, we're not really a defined generation, uh, but we will be as exceptional. So, <laughs> but my goal is to amplify the virtue. So when I read that line and that from the book, it was so powerful because I want us to think about the specialness that we am, that we have. I want us to think about what we do best, that we have experience, we have expertise. We're able to be bridge builders in the workplace between these different generations. We're able to use the power of traditional um, media acumen coupled with us being early digital adopters. We're we're in the power to embrace our independence as latchkey kids. I, for one, being I want being for one, we're in this unique position. So I thought that that was a great um, call out chip in the book. And I just wanted well, to mention that. Thank you. Uh, one thought about generations for a moment. And that is that um, 
they they really are a um, abstract construct. I mean, mm-hmm. <laughs> just just you know the fact that there are different definitions of what each generation is right. suggests that, as well as the fact that if you if you happen to be one year ahead of someone else and you're in one generation versus that another, it doesn't mean something wholly different has changed. <laughs> so I think <clears throat> I think more than anything, stages of life are the interesting piece, right? Because I do think, you know, when people say, oh, those millennials are just so narcissistic and, and selfish. Well, damn, you boomer. You were the same <laughs> way when you, in the 1970s yourself. Oh, my God. Um, and, and you can say the same about Gen Xers because, frankly, in your 20s, you are sort of self-absorbed. Right. You know, that's just sort of how, what it means. Um, so I, I do think uh, I do think there's stage life. But there are things that are different. And, like, for example, the millennial generation and Gen Z, they, they, they grew up. A millennial generation grew up with the internet. Right. Gen Z grew up with mobile, uh, and and so that you know those are different things. You know, if you're right. a Gen Gen Xer and you're 52 years old, uh, you you didn't you're sort of more like me than you are like a millennial. That's for <laughs> sure in terms of because I'm 58. Right. And neither one of us, you know, our do- the dominant technology of our childhood was television. And unless you're a TV producer or an ad, ex- ad executive, that didn't really have miracle grow effect on your career. Right. But the fact that you actually grew up as a millennial or Gen Zer with computers deeply interwoven into your upbringing means it help- you you got a career boost. Mm-hmm. And I do think that's part of the reason that millennials as a generation have, hear a lot of resentment from older people mm-hmm. is because it's envy. It's envy masked as resentment. <laughs> <laughs> it it is too, and it, it's funny you did mention this concept of generations, and that's always a touchy subject because for me, I I hit it head on because I named the show a specific generation. I talk about, but I understand it because I mean, one being a marketer, I'm just used to demographic segmentation, so. That's pretty common, but I understand it. I guess my my approach has been be, the, because there's so much media and discussions around millennials, and I understand why, because millennials came of age during the advent of social and media and social media and, 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 and media and mobile. And so just the power of that combined, you got a lot of hits and a lot of traction and a lot of conversation about millennials. And so my thing is that, okay, when we do acknowledge that generations exist, because anytime see people mention the term millennial in reference, you're acknowledging there's a generation. Let's at least acknowledge all the generations if we want to talk generations. So that's why I focus on, okay, great. Gen Xers don't get a lot of press. It's funny, interesting enough, and I'm not going to name the name of the news media organization. I'm not going to do that. But recently, there was a, a converse, a discussion about millennials and being stressed at work, I believe, on a major news organization, a cable channel. And they had someone they were interviewing from BuzzFeed or talking about the article about millennials. And the organization put up a graphic on the television mm-hmm. and they listed out all these generations because of the context of the conversation. And the source was Pew Research, which I use a lot. Um, they, they reference Gen Xers 65 to 80. But they list at first the silent generation, you know, because they wanted to, the graphic wanted to define the years of the generation since they were talking about generations. They list silent generation, 1928 to 1945. Then under it, they list, they said baby boomers, 1946 to 1964. Then right under baby boomers, they went to millennials. No. 19, I'm not making this up. Really? I, I have the graphic. 1981 to 1986. Then they said post millennials, 1996. There are, and so this was on the television. It was a viral. <laughs> it was on Twitter. I chimed in. It was, it, there was an article about it after the fact on, on Huffington about how, true enough, the story of our lives, they totally skipped Gen Xers. This is, uh, and so it was, it was funny, but not, but my point is, this is why I do what I do. <laughs> and mm-hmm. if we want to talk about generations contextually, which is fine, just, you literally skipped over Gen Xers. So um, it's just, it's just very funny, but I, I, I love the way you have shaped the conversation around stages, around expanding the years of midlife. What does that mean? It, it, it goes through not just Gen Xers, but boomers or millennials and i think that's a very refreshing conversation to have and i love what you're doing let's let, i want to talk specifically about um the u-curve and me being the uh, i'm a fan of social sciences and i and i came across 
um, this study about the U-curve of happiness. And I think you mentioned in your book where um, the average age of the, well, they, well, let me just define it. So pa- basically people call a U-curve of happiness in your life where you start on a high when you're born, obviously there's no cares in the world. And then along your life, you reach the bottom um, the, the nadir of a curve of happiness. And on average, that age is around, I think, 46. For women, mm-hmm. it's actually higher. For men, it's actually, I'm sorry, for women, it's actually lower age, and 40. For men, yeah. it's higher. And then it goes up when you hit your like late 50s. That is a very interesting, and I've actually felt it, been in mid-career, midlife, um, just from the dynamics of family and, and, and work and being laid off and all this. Can you just talk about principles specifically from your great academy that Mm -hmm. you have and how they are applicable to the core sweet spot of your book your audience and this podcast um and how can we help um and 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 i like to say this when i do my speaking and consulting coaching my goal is to reverse that u-curve to become an upward hockey stick like i (laughs) that's Mm -hmm. my that's my Mm -hmm. vision and i say this my vision is to turn mid-career um malaise to mid-career mastery can you talk mm-hmm. a little bit about modern elder and how it applies to Gen X and how we can better maximize our impact and find our unique voice at this U curve bottom of the U curve phase? Yes. So the, the here's the the basic. There's a beautiful book on this called The Happiness Curve by Jonathan Rausch that came out about a year ago. Okay. Um, so worth 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 picking up. Um, and, and there's been the studies have been across all cultures and pretty much so shows conclusively. Um, this idea that from you know 25 to about 45, there's just a slow decline of happiness, um, and it's it's the combination of the mashup of all of the responsibilities you have. It's sort of this accumulation phase. You're accumulating knowledge, mm-hmm. responsibilities, sometimes kids, sometimes variety of different responsibilities related to community, just beyond your work, um, stuff. You you know accumulate stuff, mm-hmm. and by your mid 40s, you're sort of like and. You're just a little over it. it. There's not a lot of private time, a lot of personal time. Mm-hmm. And um, so I think this is going to change a little bit for millennials and younger because actually the three-stage life really speaks to this. It, it, it's sort of a – it's a I think a, um, a collateral cost of the three-stage life because people are sort of quite linear and then they wake up in mid-40s and say, is this the life I want? Now – what happens, the reason this is actually, I think, particularly interesting for people even older than mid-40s mm-hmm. is because the narrative goes on to sort of say midlife crisis speaks to the idea that you, you, you're you not sure who you are anymore and, or, and you're not like enjoying the way your life is being led. And then there's this element of after you get through this midlife period, you go into the, the period of disease, disease and decrepitude. <laughs> um, mm. a, a, you know, and so not only do you feel bad about today, your midlife, but then you fa- feel bad about what's coming forward and your best, you feel like your best times are behind you. Wow, if yeah. that's the narrative that defines our lives, you know, we might as well give up around age 35. Um, so yeah, yeah. That, I don't, that, is not the, that is not the proper narrative to define what pe- how people really experience their lives. Right. And so let's talk about that. The U-curve of happiness shows that after about that 45 to 50 low point on the curve, people start getting happier with each uh, passing decade. So people in their 50s are happier than their 40s. Mm. People in their 60s, happier than their 50s. And people in their 70s, happier than their 60s. And why is that? So it's for a few different reasons. You move from this accumulation phase of doing what the world wants you to do to this editing phase of saying, this is who I am and this is what's important to me. Mm -hmm. That's what wisdom is about distilling down what's important. And this is how I'm going to live my life moving forward. You also have metabolized your disappointment. One, you know, disappointment equals expectations minus reality. We load ourselves up with a lot of expectations in our 20s and our 30s mm-hmm. in terms of how our life's going to be. You know, our our you know the you know our dream date, who's going to become our our spouse, and and the perfect job we're going to have, and mm. the amount of you know the beautiful home we're going to have, and the beautiful car, and of course our kids who are who are you know uh, never scream and right. you know and, and don't even need diapers for some reason. They're just like they you know they, they <laughs> so <laughs> life is different than that. You I know? know, and so. 
what happens after mid 40s is people start to get used to moderating their expectations, <laughs> limiting the things in their life that they just don't want to have to do anymore. And now that's a hard thing for a lot of people because, you know, some of the things you have to do, you just have to do because you have to make a living, et cetera. But you do start to winnow, de- winnow down what's important to you. And that's why moving into the 50s, people start to feel a little bit liberated. Mm. The other thing that starts to kick in is we get really smarter about our EQ. We get more self-aware and socially aware as we get older. So as you go into your 50s, your 60s, and your 70s, you're getting smarter and wiser about humanity, your own and other people's. Mm. And you also, there's a, you know, Laura Carsonson from the Stanford Center for Longevity has shown in a series of studies that when you have a shorter period of time in your life, whether you're someone who has AIDS in your 20s from long ago, because frankly people don't usually die from AIDS anymore, um, or someone who's got you know terminal cancer mm-hmm. at, in their teens, or someone who's 85 years old and probably has three years left to live, when you have less time in your life, there's a shift that happens at some point when you move into just being present mm. and being focused on this moment. And frankly, when people move into that place of being focused on this moment and being present, they often move out of their anxiety, out of their angst, out of their worries, into a place of just being human. Yeah. And that process tends to lead to more contentment. So wow. having said all that, that's an interesting, you know, I, I like to think of it this way, and that's my last thought on this one, Adrian, is I like to think of it as the caterpillar to the butterfly um, metamorphosis. Hmm. Uh, you know, we're familiar, that's a, that's a, a fascinating miracle in biology, is right. that within the caterpillar, lie the cells that ultimately will turn into a butterfly. And the caterpillar, in essence, creates its own tomb by spinning its chrysalis and then going in there and then coming out as a butterfly later. Mm. That, to me, describes midlife. Midlife is that chrysalis. Midlife is that dark tunnel. Midlife is that somewhat difficult time that, that people need to go interior and then start to find the internal resources to say, you know, my life moving forward is going to be flying and I'm going to be more liberated. And, and the U-curve of happiness speaks to this and says, yes, th- this is life. You have this caterpillar eating as much, you know, as many leaves as possible that <laughs> provides the fuel to go into that chrysalis <clears throat> and then come out on the other side as a butterfly. Wouldn't that be this, this life stages of, you know, 25 to 45, Mm -hmm. accumulating 45 to whatever, Mm -hmm. 55, let's say, going into this, you know, the core of midlife and and, and it can be a dark period and then coming out the other side as this beautiful, colorful butterfly that likes to fly. (laughs) Wow, that is such a powerful, man, why did not think of that? (laughs) That was such a powerful analogy, Chip. I might have to steal that from you. That, that, that was great. You got it, please. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. Oh, but oh, all of my Gen X butterflies out there. I hope you're listening. Fly. Let's fly. <laughs> that was really great. So yeah, that, that is so true because you know a lot of obviously the ti- the um, the title of your book, work wisdom at work, and a lot of the dynamics and just the um, the issues of today's multi generational workforce has become very prevalent because now we have for sometimes believe it or not up to five generations even though silence sometimes are still hanging on um, in the workforce so you have this unique um, tapestry of all these different mindsets and experiences and where the business goals at the end of the day is to create shareholder value or value for your small business or your small startup or whatever it is you have to work together and i and i know that the principles of the book will help do that how would you say just um chip for a gen xer that's in that mid-career stage that's either if it's your enterprise business approaching c-suite or c-suite or just there within all these generations and trying to find their way they're feeling some some a lot of us are feeling like that we're we're in fearful of losing our jobs. You have these smart millennials coming in that are just very aggressive, no fault of their own, just want to make sure they do good work and 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 do the best and amplify the best of who they are to offer to the company. As a Gen Xer, in order for us to be able to understand that we have really great EQ now, we are smarter, we are wiser, we have virtues, what recommendation would you give to that Gen Xer who is feeling, again, stuck, 
One is to have better job security or or based on their experience and their passions are able to maybe start their own business because the average age for successful startups today is around 42. And a lot of people don't know that. And even for high growth companies, it's even older. So what would be your recommendation or advice, uh, Chip, for that Gen Xer that's filling kind of those pain points specifically when it comes to the workplace? Well, I, I, you know, one of the things that I've found for myself that's been really helpful is um, when I'm feeling like a little bit lost and like I'm not learning anymore or I feel like I'm not building my skills and, and I'm maybe no mm-hmm. longer relevant in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, if, I, if I'd spend Friday evening or Saturday morning uh, reflecting on what I learned that week and create a, a wisdom book that has a, a list of the key lessons I had this week, it could be like, it could be related to somebody, uh, you, you had a rude awakening with somebody that just came out of left field that you just, oh, I should have seen, I should have seen that coming. I, I now have learned that when someone stops responding to my emails for a few days, uh, you know, the best thing to do is to stop and stop emailing them directly. Just like pick up the phone or go over to their desk and talk with them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so the, the, the process of actually metabolizing our lessons and then keeping track of them, mm. and then and then you know once a month maybe just reviewing all of your lessons of the last nine months. That process can help you to start feeling like you are mining your mastery. You're mm. really building the 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 proprietary set of knowledge and wisdom that is is you know uniquely you. Mm. And once you start having that sense that you have something to offer. Uh, you'll you'll feel a little bit less fearful about those you know those people nipping at your heels those millennials and the Gen Zers, mm-hmm. um, and I think that's the key is just like you, you know another exercise we do at the Modern Elder Academy is we say you know if you were to write a a um, an email to someone from a younger generation that was would give your five pieces of career advice um, that are that are so specific to you and they're not they're not cliche they're not like you know be yourself right uh, every everyone else is taken I love that that's Oscar Wilde but but it's 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 great advice but it's sort of cliche like okay be yourself mm-hmm. uh, you know we all we all we all hear that what's the thing that you can tell someone younger than you that is specific to your lessons specific to who you are in terms of what how that would be valuable you can distill that down to five things darn you you have something to offer the world mm. do not do not forget that as you get older you get more emotionally intelligent and that means you understand humans more and as much as artificial intelligence is taking over our lives it's still humans who create that artificial intelligence it's still humans who actually are you know sitting in their chairs right. in in on, you know in those companies and if you have a, a growing wisdom around humanity, you will always be valuable in the workplace. Wow. <clears throat> always be valuable in the workplace. I love that advice about the wisdom book, uh, listing out, mining, reviewing your, your lessons you've learned. That is a great, that's a great recommendation. I'm actually going to start doing that myself. And I encourage everyone listening. Chip, we've come down to the end of this conversation, man. I, there's we this, I literally could spend three hours talking about the jewels of this book because I would truly feel number one that it is a testament to the lessons um in this wisdom book the lessons that you've learned along your journey number two i think it's very timely considering just the just the pulse of the the workplace just the pulse of the marketplace when it comes to ageism conversations and just the different generations that are all working together and then number three specifically to this audience um, so I'm, I'm really appreciate you being here. But before I let you go, before I let you go, this is what we do on Gen X Amplify. There is a final question that I ask all of my guests um, just to get a little bit more insight into who they are, their brand, and their personality. So are you ready? Sure. Go for it. All right. So, Chip, if there was a song that would play every time you enter a room or when you walk down the street that perfectly fits your story and the brand of Chip Conley. What song would that be? Basically, what would be your own personal theme song? You know, <clears throat> there's so many, but I think the one I would probably pick is uh, U2's Beautiful Day. Oh, because yes. whenever that comes on, I get a big smile on my face. <laughs> I love that song. The heart is a bloom. 
Yeah. Shows up through the stony. Okay, I'm not going to try to sing it, but that is a great okay, song. Actually, you got a great voice, Adrian. No, 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 no. <laughs> that is not you. That's that's me three. That's not you two. That's that's, that's <laughs> <laughs> that is that is so not all. But I'm not Bono. Um, but no, I love that song. That's one of my favorite. That's actually one of my favorite inspirational songs. It, it is like even the beginning before he Bono hits the the, the lyrics, just the the musicianship and just you feel elated, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, that is a Absolutely. great song. So, so all right, so that's Chip Collins' personal theme song. Chip, this was great. I really enjoyed the conversation. Please let everyone know um, how they can keep up with what you're doing <coughs> with the academy, with your books, and just the best way they can keep up with you. Sure. Um, so Chip Conley, the last name is spelled C-O-N-L-E-Y. Mm-hmm. So chipconley.com, if you go to that website, you'll find information on me, um, uh, a little bit of a subsection on, on my latest book. Uh, so I've written five books, but the latest one, Wisdom at Work. Mm-hmm. And then the Modern Elder Academy, um, <clears throat> which is, we have no, you know, if you think like you're not an elder, you're an elder if, you, relatively speaking, you're hanging around with people who are younger than you. <laughs> So you could be an elder at 32 if you're in a company full of people who are 24. That's right. Uh, so the truth is it's a relative term. And we've had people from 30 to 74 come mm. to the Modern Elder Academy. It's a social enterprise, which means that over half the people are on scholarship, which allows Whoa. us to have a very socioeconomically diverse group of people uh, in our 18-person cohorts that we have each week. Wow, that is that is fascinating. I love that. Wow, that is a great that is such a great purpose mission driven um, effort you're doing. Wisdom at work, the making of a modern elder. Love it. As soon as I saw the title, as soon as I saw the premise, I went out and bought it. I used my audible credits and actually got the audio book as well. So I can continue to get all that wisdom in my earbuds while I drive. Chip, it's been a blast. I'm so honored to have you on and I'm looking forward to continue to see all the great things you're doing. Thank you, Adrian. Thanks for the you know spreading spreading the the news that uh, you're getting older and better. <laughs> older and better. Fly butterflies. Your next butterflies fly. Thank you so yeah. much. All right. Okay. Yes, that was the phenomenal, the awesome, wonderful Chip Conley, founder of the Modern Elder Academy and the best-selling author of this great book titled Wisdom at work the making of a modern elder that was a great conversation love love his mission love what he's doing to reshape redefine what it means to be an elder in this society i tell you and it hits right right in the middle of you of this audience of me gen x and even you that's listening in that happen to be millennial or boomer we're all in this mid-life phase. So definitely cop a copy, <laughs> cop a copy, cop a copy or grab a copy of this book or two or three or four of this book, Wisdom at Work. And remember, you can also follow Chip at chipconley.com and continue to follow his path of what he's doing with his academy and all of his thought leadership. And as always from me, thank you so much for listening to Gen X Amplified. And as always, to get the full show notes, Go to genxamplify.com. Also go to adrianporter.com to check out what I'm doing with this podcast and with this movement and what I'm doing to help people like us unlock our potential and create more impact as Gen Xers. And you can always find Gen X Amplified on your favorite podcast app or platform such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And... And if you enjoy this content, please, please give Gen X Amplified a rating and review on your favorite podcast app. I appreciate it. And that also helps to spread the noise and the word about what we're doing and to get more listeners to this podcast. All right. So again, I'm your host, Adrian Porter, and you've been listening to Gen X Amplified, the podcast dedicated to you, the powerful and exceptional generation between those brilliant boomers and those magnificent millennials. Remember, it's more than a podcast. It is a movement. Take care.